lighting people? It's been close to 150 years since the world has had electric light. But scientists believe that it's been billions of years that natural sunlight has been around. A couple of months ago at Light Fair 2023, Jay Goodman's presentation entitled The Sun, What You See is Less Than Half of What You Get, was met with some very positive reviews by some smart lighting people that we know and trust. We were curious to learn more about how the lighting entrepreneur was connecting the topics of natural and electric light, so we invited him to talk with us, with you. Jay, hello and thank you for joining us today for Five Big Questions. Al, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited for this. I appreciate it, too. No, we're so glad that you're here and we've known each other a long time, but this topic is one we've never really talked about, uh, you know, man to man, lighting guy to lighting guy. So from your perspective, just the big picture, what is, how do you draw that connection between natural sunlight and electric light? Uh, first and foremost is even a term from the terminology, you know, the natural sunlight, which I would call the natural state of us being outdoors. Uh, over 75% of it is not even visual. So we in the lighting industry, we hear light, we think it's what you see between 400 and 700 nanometer uh, wavelength range. But frankly, over, over three times the energy of the sun from three times non-visual versus one time visual, the energy we get from the sun the vast majority of it, you, you can't even see. So I frankly like to refer to it just as our natural state, which is outdoors versus indoors now. So our natural state is in a giant range of wavelengths from 300 to 3000. And our indoor electric light is 400 to 700. And what all I say is if the majority of what we get from the sun, you can't see somebody somehow figured out that we need an awful lot of that and we get none of it indoors. Interesting perspectives and uh, actually enlightening as well. So a lot of our talk about human health and circadian lighting, um, they tend to focus a lot on the blue light conversation, which is you know a specific portion of that spectrum that you just referenced. So why should we be focused more, say, on the infrared side of things or those other things? Let's go a little deeper. Uh, I think it's actually both. So I'm a big proponent of the blue, um, you know, what would be considered sky blue. I think BIOS might have that as a registered trademark, but, um, you know, filling in that cyan gap where the 480 nanometer blue from the sun triggers in your intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells and suppresses melatonin. That is a science that I think is absolutely spot on. But the issue that I have with it is in the sun, when we're exposed to that blue light, we're never exposed to it in the absence of three times of the amount of it of infrared. So while I believe the blue light is very important for us, I also believe the blue light with the non-visual infrared is really what makes for the overall health and well-being and sleep and melatonin suppression, et cetera. So I'm not trying to debunk anything with the blue. I'm a believer in it, but I believe it's the starting point and supplemental to a dramatically bigger issue of the non-visual energy from the sun. Makes sense. So that this isn't a contrarian view. This is more of a, a kind of expanding the, the scope of how we look at uh, the, the, the interaction between health and, and light and natural and electric light, it sounds like. Yeah, I believe the blue yeah. light is the tip of the iceberg. And I'm trying to talk yeah. about the, the other 90 percent that's underneath the water. So one of the uh, smart lighting people who recommended that you and I chat, um, I, I asked him, I said, so what should I ask Jay? And he said, ask Jay does lumens per watt matter or lumens per square foot matter? And that's the question. So how do you answer that, Jay? Right, Jay. That's, a, uh, that's a tough one because a lumen is really only a measure of visible light. And here I am trying to say, hey, we need more non-visual energy than we need visual. So if all we're measuring is, you know, if the measure of something um, being up to health standards, safety, code, whatever, is lumens per watt, I think it's it falls way, and not only does it fall way short of what we actually need in, the, in our environment, is I think it's a metric that actually hinders adding back in all the non-visual energy. 
because there's no there's no energy free lunch if you're going to produce additional infrared or even by the way we do need uv to synthesize vitamin d i mean at our age almost everybody I know is taking vitamin d tablets well you need uva from the sun to synthesize vitamin d if you want to add any of this back into the indoor spectrum you need to consume some wattage which is energy to do it so very strict lumens per watt standards for code only hinders actually fixing this problem and the other problem is lumen is a measure of visual visual energy when at some point we're going to have to actually talk about and by the way i'm not a scientist we are going to have to talk about though is photons per second or optical watts just please don't ask me to explain either one right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, good thing this is a short form interview and not a 30-minute uh, documentary. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll alleviate you of that responsibility. But uh, exactly. but Jay, w w when we when we layered this conversation now on top to on top of like the application of electric light, and you think about those students in the classroom or the patient in a hospital patient room, how does this conversation enter those real world applications? I mean, it's got far reaching impact on each situation that you, you just brought up as well as thousands and thousands of others. So visual, in our body, visual light triggers the release of cortisol, which is the fight or flight hormone. Okay, the stress hormone that people refer to as cortisol. Well, it's the infrared energy from the sun through our skin through our mitochondria, which produces melatonin. Melatonin is the body's most powerful antioxidant. The melatonin is what balances the cortisol, which keeps us in a hormonal balance. Well, if we're, in, if we're indoors under visual light only, all we're doing is synthesizing cortisol, AKA the stress hormone, and the implications and the really bad um, results of that are, are a lot. I mean, I can't even begin to, uh, to describe how much being in oxidative stress actually um, can affect people. I mean, talking from anxiety, depression, I mean, they're linking diabetes, you know, increased uh, diabetes other, and other ailments that are... Um, that are that are really to have giant implications for uh, society and even in hospitals, this will blow you away. Is there the University of Michigan literally just did a study? I think in 2019, you were there's a 20 percent higher mortality rate recovering from surgery in a bed further away from a window in the hospital. And just for the, to simplify, I'm a simple guy. I'm a beer league hockey player. I'm a simple guy. Mortality rate means you have a 20% higher chance of dying, <laughs> okay? Strictly if you're the recovery bed that you're in in the hospital is further away from the window. Now, they don't open those windows, which, by the way, they should because the air is amazing for you. But the only thing coming through that window is sunlight. And even that, the window's glazed, so a majority of the energy we need is not even getting through, but some of it is. And that some of it is enough to have a statistically correlated um, result like that. A amazing uh, piece of research and way to quantify the effects of this natural versus electric light conversation, Jay. And and you know when when we when we think about you know the big picture of things, and, and you've been a lighting guy for a long time, um, entrepreneur, where you know, you, you founded Lumina Optics and then exited after merging with another company, and now you're the founder of a new entrepreneurial a new entrepreneurial venture um, called Apre Illumination. So tell us more about Apre Illumination and and how you folks are addressing this conversation about natural and electric light. Um. So I, I, listen, I'm, I'm longer in the lighting industry than I, than I care to admit. Uh, and I am certainly guilty of proliferating a lot of fixtures that are out in the marketplace in lots of different manners. But uh, I believe to my core that the natural state is outdoors and 
no matter what technology we've got now, we're still only in the minuscule stages of trying to mimic that sunlight. Um, so my next venture with uh, Prey, while we're in a little bit of stealth mode, and maybe this interview is not the most stealth thing to do, uh, our uh, game plan is to address this problem and, uh, and give, give people some options. Jay, I always learn something when we talk. You have an interesting view on, on um, lighting norms and, and just the way people should go about or think about lighting in the way I've seen you operate over the years and even interact on social media. So thank you for enlightening me and the Inside Lighting audience on, on this very interesting topic. I appreciate you joining us today for Five Big Questions. Al, I cannot thank you enough. I really, first, it's great to see you again as usual. And uh, just thanks so much. And um, I, I hope that this is the first uh, that the industry maybe starts to hear about some of this, but I can guarantee you it ain't the last. <laughs> Hey there, we really enjoyed that discussion. We hope that you did as well. Be sure to click that big LED logo next to me. And what that'll do is subscribe you to our YouTube channel so you don't miss the next five big questions interview. And YouTube subscribers always receive an early preview to the next interview before we even post it on the Inside Lighting website. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.